The following podcast contains spoilers for Star Wars The Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, and The Mandalorian up to Season 2, Episode 4. Hello and welcome to the Nothing But Static YouTube channel, um, or potentially if I decide to upload this onto the main Nothing But Static feed as a bonus episode or something, hello there. But uh, today we are taking a look at the history of Mandalore, the Dark Saber, Bo-Katan, Sabine Wren, and Ahsoka Tano. And if you've just heard all those words and gone, what is all of that? Then congratulations, you've not watched The Clone Wars or Rebels, but you might have clicked on this because you know what a Mandalorian is because you're watching The Mandalorian. This is the video for you. <laughs> Is, what I, is how I'm pitching this. Um, and if, you, if you're after a representative, hello. <laughs> this is Chris. Uh, um, no, Chris is uh, joining us to, joining me today on this one because basically I, I, I thought about doing a video going through the history of all these different things so that anybody watching The Mandalorian who hasn't seen Clone Wars or Rebels can catch up. But I thought there's a few videos that do that already and none of them are very conversational. They're all sort of very just like a thousand names, places, dates thrown at you and it's actually quite overwhelming so i thought one way to do it that might feel a little bit more comfortable for people is to do it in the form of a little podcast so i'm going to take chris who hasn't seen any of those shows uh, rebels or clone wars or uh, is ready the sort of the sub- supplemental like comic material that came with those but he is watching the mandalorian and he's about to come across ahsoka tano and to give him some context for her the dark saber bo katan who uh, who chris would have met in the previous episode of mandalorian so i just thought this would be a nice way to sort of Get, get you through it i mean i've done it from i've done it mostly from memory i sat down and sort of just like laid out what the timeline as i understood it for mandalore and these various people and objects and then i had to there's a couple a couple of moments i had to double check so um i'm just gonna put this out there now if there's anything i miss intentional um yeah i know there's a bit where darth maul's imprisoned because of sidious not in here don't care not relevant like it's uh <laughs> it's, it's how darth maul was still alive in there it is <laughs> Yeah, because he because he is he is involved in this Mandalorian thing. He actually holds the dark saber for a period of time, so he's going to come into this story a little bit. But I'm going to sort of take Chris through it, um, and hopefully by doing that, take you guys, the listeners, through the same. So should we should we should we get crack? Oh yeah, I, I think I already said. Uh, forgive me if there's anything I've mis- misremembered or gotten slightly wrong. I'm, I've double checked everything that I was less sure about, but the rest of it. I mean, I watched Rebels and Clone Wars within the last few months, so I'm fairly confident i'm remembering this all correctly um so yeah we'll give it a go <laughs> we'll find out if i'm wrong at um, a later date <laughs> now that dan's outlined his goals um my goal for this is to be a pedantic arsehole um so uh <laughs> yeah and just just make it as complicated as i possibly can Amazing. um because like... it's reached a point now where dan's making me do podcasts about animations i've not even watched <laughs> so like <laughs> you know the only the only suitable revenge is uh, to be a right little dickhead. So yeah, <laughs> fun times, in. fun times. So um, we'll start. I mean, we literally had to start sadly very early in the history of Mandalore. So basically, when humans first found the planet, it was wait, coming... wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. First question: What is Mandalore? It is a planet in the Star Wars universe. Okay, cool. Yeah. See, I, I didn't know that. Genuinely, I didn't know that. So. Oh. There you go. So well, the thing with Mandalore, which is interesting, and the reason it was uh, it was difficult to inhabit because there were these giant things that roamed across it called mythosaurs. And the, the, the planet actually had a mineral on it called Beskar, which is a metal, which when forged into armor is extremely strong and can resist Jedi uh, lightsaber attack. And it can also resist um, blaster bolts being hit. It. You've, you've seen that in the Mandalorian. He, mm-hmm. he acquired yeah. Beskar in the first season and got a full suit of armor made out of it. Um and it's been reforged and reforged over the years. So most Mandalorians, when they get their armor, even if it was melted down and then reforged into armor for them, it did at some point presumably belong to a historical Mandalorian because there was only so much of this metal on this planet. But to get hold of that, they had to conquer these mythosaurs. So they became very fierce warriors very early on in their history. That's kind of the start of Mandalorian like history was there was them mm-hmm. conquering these mythosaurs and they rode them across the planet it's pretty awesome there's a guy it was named after the leader a guy called mandalore the great um we don't know a lot about him except for he pissed off the jedi and had re- repeated fights with them um <laughs> presumably because he had so armor that, in- that could reflect blaster and <laughs> lightsaber attack <laughs> 
Is that in Clone Wars then, or is that actually just a detail I've missed from the prequels? Or um, that is was hinted at in uh, the first season of Mandalorian. The the forger that makes his armor talks of Mandalore the Great and the Mythosaurs. Right. It's not put in too much detail there, but with other supplemental materials, fans have sort of put together the rest of that story. Right, um, okay. What we are about to hear, though, the next thing that happened has been talked about in Rebels and, and maybe Clone Wars as well. So this stuff is 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 more concrete. But that is the rough early history of Mandalore. Um, so then, mm-hmm. thousands of years ago, before any of the um, main events of Star Wars, like the Clone Wars and stuff, there was this guy called Tar Vizsla. And he was a Mandalorian that actually joined the Jedi, which didn't go down well with the rest of the Mandalorians. Shit. Um he actually forged this thing called the Dark Saber, which you will have seen because uh, we've seen um, Moff Gideon in Mandalorian in the Mandalorian show has that. Um, he used that at the end of the first season. So this Dark Saber is like a pretty special version of a lightsaber, and it was obviously different because it was forged by a, a, the very first Mandalorian to cross over into the ranks of the Jedi. Eventually, he actually left the Jedi and went back to Mandalore to unite his people wielding the blade. Because, and this is something you'll learn very quickly about Mandalore, Chris. If there isn't a civil war happening on Mandalore at any given time, something's up. (laughs) It it is a planet. And and I swear, if you wanted to play a Mandalorian civil war drinking game, (laughs) you could absolutely do that. And you would be very drunk very quickly. So they are constantly <laughs> fighting each other. There's different clans and sects, but he actually, um, this guy, Tar Vizsla, re- he reunited the planet. One of the few times that's been the case under this blade. So this blade became a symbol of leadership to the Mandalorians. Um, and it passed down as the years went on. What's really interesting about this, uh, even after he died off, for a little bit peace stuck, but of course, even with the blade on the planet, they all started fighting each other again. Because <laughs> Mandalore, <laughs> you know, civil war yeah. is their way. So much, much closer to today, we're talking right on the cusp of the Clone Wars. This lady, Duchess Satine, uh, Satine Kreese, t- takes over Mandalore. She becomes the their leader. There's a prime minister and a duchess. It's a bit like our prime minister and queen situation, you know, in in England. Mm-hmm. You know, there's two sort of like figureheads at the top of the the, ta- the power. How the power is divulged is a bit mm, iffy. They don't really explain. In Star Wars, exactly how the politics of Mandalore 100% work. We have an idea, but we don't know for sure. Uh, but either way, um, she's in charge, and she actually wants to move the Mandalorians to pacifism. She's like, we've spent years civil warring. We're just civil warring all over the place. It's ridiculous. We've had enough of Marvel. Um, <laughs> Captain America can fuck off. No, so, she's, so she basically just thinks it's silly that they keep fighting amongst each other, and she promotes pacifism. So a bunch of Mandalorians who disagree with that fight them. <laughs> Of course. Obviously. So she banishes... That is the way. <laughs> but there are thankfully more people on her side than not. So she banishes those who are still looking to hold the old warrior ways to a moon called Concordia, which is a moon nearby to the planet Mandalore. And they sort of start forming this group called Death Watch. Now, we'll come back to them in a minute, because this is where Ahsoka Tano enters the story. So the Clone Wars um, begin, and Mandalore stays neutral. They don't want to join the Separatists or the Republic because they're pacifists and they don't want no part and no war. And they actually end up becoming, by default, the leader of a bunch of other nearby systems that also wish to remain neutral. So Mandalore stops being a planet and starts to become a bit of a system of planets. And it's that, that wields some power. Um, and it's worth noting that during this time, the Death Watch guys, which are led by a guy called Pre Vizsla, who is a descendant of Tar Vizsla, the guy that first forged the Darksaber, and Bo-Katan, who you will have met this week in Mandalorian, they were part of this Death Watch group. And they basically, it turns out, were useless. They um, tried multiple times to overthrow Mandalore during this period, like as the Clone Wars were starting. Multiple times. Nothing worked. There was a ridiculous plot where they were trying to poison tea for children. They teamed up with the Separatists to try and do it. That didn't work out. And the way it ends up is Death Watch end up being pretty much on their ass. Everyone around them an enemy. Not much going on for them. But that's when Ahsoka enters the picture. Because Ahsoka was a, um, a young Jedi that was given to Anakin Skywalker during the Clone Wars uh, to be his like apprentice. Which Ugh, is a terrible... Well, we, know. We, know, we know how that works out for people. <laughs> yeah, like 
It's a, to, uh, giving Anakin an apprentice. I do not know what they were thinking. They weren't even sure initially if they should train Anakin, but now it's like give him an apprentice. <laughs> He's reckless. Let's let him teach someone that. <laughs> Um, um, and that works out how you'd expect. They become very, very close, um, and they fight along inside each other in, in a huge number of battles. And he, she does pick up some of his like more rebellious spirit. Like she's not a hundred percent behind the Republic at all times. Like she will voice her opinion if they make a decision she doesn't agree with. She's a bit brash, like Anakin in that way. She's kind of become a fan favorite character, I think, partly for that reason. That and she she's a badass that du- wields dual wield lightsabers, which is always just fans just love that shit no matter what, don't they? Um, there were a few Very occasions. True. There were a few occasions when she kind of even questioned whether the Jedi should be fighting a war. Like they're supposed to be peacekeepers. Like that morality was something she often wondered about. I don't think she ever voiced it. I think she always, on the surface, would say, "No, we're fighting to bring peace to the galaxy." Um, but it doesn't. I always got the impression that hypocrisy didn't sit right with her. So then came a really uh, pivotal in, uh, incident in her lifetime when, basically, there was a bombing at the Jedi Temple um, in protest of the Jedi and their, the war they were essentially waging on behalf of the Republic, and not in the name of peace, but in the name of a government and how tied up they were in this government. And Ahsoka got framed for it. And without investigating, Shit. without anything, the Jedi were just like, well, you're stripped of your rank, and we're just going to hand you over to the Republic. We're not going to deal with you ourselves, we're going to hand you to this government. Even though we're supposed to be an order unto ourselves, we're that entrenched with the Republic, they can have you. But Anakin believed she was innocent. So he fought to find the information that would redeem her, would make her in- to prove her innocence. He succeeded, and the Jedi were like, ah, oh, shit, that was awkward. Um... Do you want to be a Jedi again? And she was like, nah, mate. <laughs> and boned out. Because <laughs> she was totally done with them. Because she was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, I already had my concerns about how tied up you are with this Republic. But you're, you know, you, you, you weren't willing to defend me. You weren't willing to investigate. You took the facts on the, on the surface. And it, you're, you're too entrenched in the politics now. Um, so she's completely out. She's like, I'm gone. And she goes off to be a right. nomad. Not interested in the Jedi way anymore. Separate, okay. separate to that, we've got Darth Maul, who is alive, having um, fallen down that pit minus his legs. He managed to build himself giant, and this is true, spider legs out of robot parts <laughs> and lived and scrounged on the surface of a planet for years and years, eating like rats and basically going a bit feral. This is my favorite part. He has a brother called Savage Opress. Sorry. Savage Opress, <laughs> who finds right. him, who finds him, brings him back to sort of society, unferals him, and takes him back to his home planet to get um, proper robotic legs that are, you know, like a human legs, <laughs> instead of the spider legs that he had. Um, so M- Maul's like pretty pissed with Obi-Wan. Understandably, he chopped him in half. <laughs> So yeah, that's fair. I, I I don't know about you, Chris, but if I get chopped in half, oh, I'm livid, livid <laughs> constantly, fuming. So he goes on a bit of a mission to get back at Obi Wan, but it's a really long winded plan. Let me tell you. So what he does, and I swear this is this is like 100 percent what happens because when I first like well, before I'd seen the episodes, I heard some of this stuff and was like, that can't be right. But this is exactly what happens. He finds Death Watch, the Mandalorian cult Death Watch, and says, "Hey guys." If you help me bring all of the criminal underworld under my thumb, because there are a lot of you and you're warriors, I'll help you take Mandalore back. And they're like, that sounds pretty sweet. Except for Bo-Katan. They're like, they're like this dude's got spider legs. We better listen to him. <laughs> yeah, at this point, he's back to his normal legs or right. his robot yeah. legs. But still, I mean, the obviously evil Sith Lord. Who knew, right? Like, we should definitely trust him. So Pre Vizsla, the descendant of Tar Vizsla, who has the dark saber and leads Death Watch, is all for this. He thinks this is a great idea. Teaming up with more. Nothing else has fucking worked. But Bo-Katan, who is his second, and I'll reveal now, Chris, turns out is the sister of of Duchess Satine twist in the story. So the Duchess that wants pacifism, her sister is with Death Watch, the sort of terrorist group that spun off that wanted to keep being warrior types. But she's not too comfortable with the whole Darth Maul thing, which is, I think, fair? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. 
He's, yeah. So they actually catch a pretty clever plan. So they go out and they get all of the various, uh, like, um, all the evil cartels in the Star Wars universe under their thumb. The Huts, the Pikes, the Black Suns, and the Crimson Dawns, all under Darth Maul's rule. And he uses his, the, the, the Mandalorian might to sort of force that to be in the case. And then he has this pretty great plan to take Mandalore back for pre uh, for pre Vizsla. He and the crime gangs all show up on Mandalore and start fucking shit up. And they're like, well, you're pacifists, can't do nothing. Can't do nothing. And they start fucking shit up. So then the Death Watch guys come in to... I don't know what, so literally, they're just like committing crimes and they're just like, can't do nothing. <laughs> can't do nothing. Yeah. Nuh-uh. No, you you can't do nothing because I, I said that you, you, once I touch you, you can't touch me for 10 seconds after. That's the rule. Like, it was, it's like childish yeah. nonsense like that. Yeah, it's literally... Like, what, a sh- what a lovely planet you have here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> like, it's, they just land and start like immediately committing crimes, murdering, stealing, all that shit. So then the Death Watch guys show up, who are actually in league with the with the with you know with the crime syndicates, but the people don't know that. And they're like, "Well, this is what you get for being pacifists, you know." Us us Death Watch people, we're warriors. We can save you from these guys. And they're like, "Please do." So they basically hand Mandalore to him and the Death Watch guys, and he rids Mandalore of of the crime syndicates. I say rids them; they leave willingly because they're all working together. So. This guy Pre Vizsla is now essentially deposed Duchess Satine. She's like captured, and he's like, "Well, thanks, Darth Maul. I'm sure you're not going to at all betray me now um, that this deal is done." So, of course, Darth Maul murders him. <laughs> Darth Maul right. takes off takes off his head, um, and wields the dark saber and says, "I am in charge of fucking Mandalore now." <laughs> So Shit. half the Mandalorians are like, cool, scary dude from Dathomir, horns, tattoos, all that stuff. Yep, that's the leader. <laughs> and uh, quite a few of them, or a handful of them, uh, led by Bo-Katan, split off and are like, that ain't cool. <laughs> so they they leave. So now we've got yet another Mandalorian civil war, take a shot, where the ones that are happy to be led by Maul, because they just saw him take out the old leader, and they do live by a rule of like, warrior so it's like he beat their old you know uh, their old leader in a fight he's leader (laughs) the others not comfortable with Darth Maul ruling Mandalore split off into this group called the Night Owls which is led by Bo-Katan so it turns out the reason Maul was so interested in Mandalore is because he knows full well that Obi-Wan Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Duchess who he's just captured had a thing Real, ah, right. Real close. Real close. Never explicitly outlined what how far they got, but the implication is I mean, at one point I think he literally says to her, if you'd ever have asked, I'd have left the Jedi in a second. <laughs> oh wow. So that they're very, very close. And because you know, because they both knew their place in the galaxy, they sort of never acted on it, which is crazy. So Darth Maul sends the message out that hey, Obi Wan, come save her. I, I've got her. Obi Wan shows up, and Maul just kills her in front of him. Jeez, revenge, right? <laughs> like brutal. But poor Satine is now dead. So the only real rightful ruler of Mandalore would be her sister, Bo Katan, who's off leading this like separatist group, these the Night Owls. So a few years go by with Darth Maul in charge, and I'm not going to go into the details of this stuff because this is where his brother gets killed, he gets imprisoned, he gets freed again. He hides the dark saber back on his home planet, and he ends up back ruling Mandalore. He goes through a whole arc, but it's just not relevant to this. Now, it's implied here that some of the remnants of Death Watch pre Vizsla's group that didn't end up under either Bo Katan or Darth Maul span off, became religious sort of extremists, and started following the much stricter code in the ideas of Mandalore the Great. And it's that group of Mandalorians that around this time would have saved a young Din Jaren from the Separatists mm. and inducted him into their way. Who's, this the, is the, way. who's the Mandalorian? Exactly yeah. that. So this that happens around this time while Maul is kind of leading, but the Clone Wars are still happening. Um it's it's yeah it, it's only ever, that's that stuff is less fact at this point. It's been implied heavily by the content we've got from the Mandalorian. 
but no one's outright said the exact timing of that. But if he was running away from Separatist droids, which we've seen, and this group came in that uh, Bo-Katan has said are like religious zealots, extremists, sort of separate from everything else, you can kind of... That's a thing we're piecing together rather than a thing we've been actually directly shown, if that makes so sense. So was that, was, was that subsect known before the Mandalorian or did the Mandalorian no. invent this set of Mandalorians? Pretty much invented them. We had, we, 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 they were called the Watch, so we can assume they might have spun off from some of the remnants of Death Watch. Uh, they just took the word death out of it because you know it's free that's clearly the name of a group of bad guys um, um yeah Mandal- the mandalorian kind of has introduced those and that caused a lot of confusion when mandalorian first started airing we're all going well he can't take off his helmet but in the clone wars the mandalorians could just freely take off their helmets it wasn't really part of their code where does that come from um right okay so learning that kind of made more sense it's you you learn it in reverse if you just watch the mandalorian because you just assume all mandalorians can't take off their helmets and then you see them doing it and you're like what the fuck whereas for people who'd watched clone wars and rebels when he wouldn't take off his helmet that's when the what the fuck happened (laughs) but it's the same experience i think just in reverse like you're sort of you're either intrigued as to who the other group are if you've only watched the mandalorian and if you've watched clone wars and rebels then you're kind of intrigued as to where he comes from and what's going on with him yeah yeah but well, the, the story will sort of dovetail back to him, but I just wanted to point out this is roughly the point in the tale where that happens. We're over halfway through, okay. by the way, so you can be re- you can be relieved. We can do we can do well, well yeah, we're good we're good chunk over that halfway point now. So we're we're on our way to being done with a reasonable time, which is which is worrying. <laughs> I'm starting to look at the clock like ugh. Um, That's all right, don't worry. So ho- hopefully this is interesting to people. Um, so yeah, Bo-Katan had been leading this sort of unsuccessful civil war against Maul to try and get Mandalore back for a while, when she actually bumps into the nomad Ahsoka Tano. No longer affiliated with the Jedi, no longer affiliated with the Republic, and she convinces Ahsoka to help, because she's like, well, you ain't a Jedi anymore, because the problem they had on Mandalore was by by being neutral, they could never get the help of the Republic. Because the Republic were like, well, we'll help you if you join. And they're like, no, we don't want to join. So it's like the Republic, so they were always on their own on Mandalore. So, you know, that's kind of what the problem was. But, you know, yeah. Ahsoka, no longer affiliated with the Jedi, totally free to do that. And she agrees. She'd been living kind of on Coruscant in, like, the underworld. She agrees to help. So she actually goes to um, Anakin and Obi-Wan to see if they can spare any troops at all. And this is actually just before the start of the movie Revenge of the Sith. So they're like, yeah, I, I, we can help you, I guess, because Darth Maul is a Sith. And as the Jedi, we kind of want to stop them. So maybe we can spare a couple of people for you. And then they're like, oh, the Emperor's been kidnapped. We're going to have to go. We're just going to leave you with the um, with the 501st Battalion, which is the battalion she worked with most when she fought in the Clone Wars with Captain Rex, who is the main clone she was associated with and befriended over the years. And when she finds out she's going to get that one battalion to take with her to Mandalore to help free it from Maul... She goes to see them, and they've all painted their helmets. So you've got a picture of Ahsoka up uh, in front of you, I believe. The you know how she's mm-hmm. got the sort of the orangey face with the white markings. Yeah, all the clone troopers have painted their faces out of respect for her. They fought alongside her for years, and they respect Ahsoka and 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 uh, uh, to the point where they they decide to go under her colors for this particular mission. Oh, nice! Is this and is this the series that aired recently then? Uh, th- yeah, this happens in the in the most recent series of Clone Wars, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they all go, and then this big battle happens that's famous, that's called the Siege of Mandalore. And this is a huge, epic, finale-scale battle where the clone troopers and Ahsoka and the Night Owls, with, led by Bo-Katan, all st- storm Mandalore to try and take out Maul. Um, I could go into the details of the fight. It's really awesome, but I'm not gonna. They win, because, <laughs> you know, good, right. good yeah. guys. So Bo-Katan is instated as leader of um, of Mandalore. The um, uh, the uh, Dark Saber is nowhere to be found because D- Maul hid it on his home planet. Ahsoka captures Maul and is on her way to taking him back to the Republic, to the Jedi, to let them deal with whatever with them. And she's on the ship with the handful of troops that you know that she most knows and and, and respects. And that's when Order mm-hmm. sixty six comes through. Now, for those who don't remember Order 66, Order 66 is from Revenge of the Sith. It's when the Emperor gave 
the the um, all the clones the orders to kill all the Jedi. Ahsoka uh, basically escapes just um, and manages to um, remove the chip in Rex's head that's controlling him with that order. And then the ship they're on crashes, Maul escapes, and they escape, but Ahsoka leaves her two lightsabers behind, um, essentially faking her death. Because obviously right, if the clones, okay. are, if, the, if the Empire thinks she died on that ship, they're not going to send out anyone after her. Yeah. Okay. That's the theory anyway. doesn't work out too great, because shortly thereafter, the Empire rises, which fucks over Bo-Katan, because Bo-Katan just got control of Mandalore back. And then the Empire rises immediately. She, well, sorry, she she gets the she gets control of Mandalore back. Decides to join the Republic because the Republic helped her take it back a little bit with those troops. And then the Republic becomes the Empire like ten minutes later. <laughs> and because Bo-Katan is not a monster, she's like, "Well, that's not cool. I don't. I'm not down with this Empire stuff." They remove her as leader of Mandalore and put in place this guy Gar Saxon. I know it's crazy, right? Like, how many people? She's were... having all the bad luck. I know, <laughs> like literally, t- it was. It, it must have been like the same day <laughs> that she was like, "I joined the Republic." They're like, "We're now the Empire." <laughs> She's like, "Fuck." Um, so yeah, because she wasn't willing to help out the Empire too much, they uh, removed her and put this guy Gar Saxon in power instead. So now we get to the sort of content of Rebels because Ahsoka um, ends up. Um, well, first of all, she gets these awesome new white lightsabers. Uh, the Empire send these guys called Inquisitors after her that have red lightsabers. They're kind of like Sith, but their their job is to just scrape up the remaining, like just track down and hunt down the remaining Jedi that got away from Order 66 and kill them. They find Ahsoka. She defeats them and takes the crystals out of their red lightsabers and discovers that if she's powerful enough in the Force, she can purify them. And she ends up with these two awesome white lightsabers. They're fucking badass. I love it. Um, then she bumps into... Um, or she ends up sort of working with the... So the problem with the rebellion when it first starts against the Empire is that it's a bunch of groups of... Separate groups of individuals rebelling on individual planets. So the show, Star Wars Rebels, is about this crew of the ship called the Ghost. And they're on this planet called Lothal and they're rebelling against the Empire there. But it becomes clear that... Um, like, uh, what's his name? Organa. Leia Organa's dad i forget his first name off the top of my head there's some there's some of my credibility gone bail organa so bail organa um is starting to gather information about all these different rebellions that are happening and he's starting to reach out to them to see if they can get organized because they ain't going to beat the empire as a bunch of separate cells they're only going to beat the empire if they come together and he uses ahsoka to sort of be uh, like an informant slash, you know, intelligence officer. She starts communicating with all these guys, giving them tips on where they can hit the Empire that will hurt. Try, you know, if, if any of those cells get information that can help them defeat the Empire, then it gets passed to all the cells. So it becomes this quite organized thing with Ahsoka at the center. And she ends up helping out this particular crew of the Ghost, which are the main characters of Rebels, a couple of different times over the years. One of the members of this crew of the Ghost is Sabine Wren. Now, her mother actually... She's a Mandalorian. And her mother actually fought alongside Bo-Katan when they did the Siege of Mandalore. But because it became Imperial, she ended, ended up sort of... Sabine ended up being trained as, a, as an Imperial officer. And then left them to go join the Rebellion because she didn't like what they were up to. But when, right, she's, tra- okay. but when she's traveling with the Ghost and Ahsoka... They end up stumbling across... They end up getting mixed up with Darth Maul, who's still about and old now, um, and end up finding the Darksaber. So Sabine goes back to do what Bo-Katan couldn't initially and free Mandalore from the Imperials. And is this all still before the Mandalorian? Yes. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting to... We're just about to... We're, we're on the verge of meeting up with the Mandalorian, essentially. Um... So this, because this was sort of like, this is just before the, ba- so <laughs> Star Wars dates are really funny. They have, it's, so the way it works is if anyone wants to do a date in Star Wars, they do it BBY, the, before the Battle of Yavin, or ABY, after the Battle of Yavin. The Battle of Yavin is the battle from the end of A New Hope. <laughs> so it's like, this happened five years before A New Hope or 10 years after it. Like, you know, you know that's how What's they- weird about that is like, in this conversation alone, you've described like, t- 
10 battles that seem more epic than that one but yeah <laughs> yeah that's a really good point <laughs> You're right. Yeah, the Siege of Mandalore particularly is a really cool epic one. Um, Two years later, they blew up a bigger Death Star, but they don't count from that. (laughs) No, they don't. I guess because that was the first Star Wars movie. That's how fans, I guess, do it. But I don't think in the world of Star Wars they use that system. I hope not anyway. Dear Lord, that would be very confusing. Um, So basically, Sabine Wren, uh, whose mother actually fought with Bo-Katan back in the day, she goes back to Mandalore. And she's like, we got to get rid of these Imperials because this is insane. Like, we, they're, they're, they're this Gar-, Gar Saxon guy is sort of running Mandalore, not on the behalf of the Mandalorians, but for this empire. So she challenges him to like a, like a fight, <laughs> basically. Um, she's got the Darksaber um, and she beats him. But she does that typical thing where she spares his life. And when she turns her back, he tries to kill her. But then her mother kills him, which essentially, Chris, and take a drink, starts another civil war. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So on Mandalore, we've got the Mandalorians who are, who are staying um, on the side of the Empire. And the Mandalorians that are joining Sabine and her mother and the Ren clan against the Empire. Um, I'm just trying to find my place in my... I did write a few notes. I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, so once that happens... Oh, in, oh, it's worth noting here as well. Sorry, to clarify. One of the clans that joins Sabine is Bo-Katan and the Night Owls. But Bo is a little bit older now. She's already had her chance. And when Sabine says, you should take the Darksaber, she initially goes, no. I've, I was leader for all of five minutes. It wasn't my destiny. It didn't work out. The Empire took it over. I made some bad decisions. I mean, we shouldn't have even joined... We shouldn't have joined the Rebellion, um, realistically. Um, be- not the Rebellion, sorry. The Republic, because that's what led us to being in the Empire in the first place. And so, no. But when Sabine frees Mandalore from the Imperials, she's like, well, I'm going to go back and help the Rebellion. I don't want to stay on Mandalore and lead it. I'm a, I'm a child still. So she then does actually give the Darksaber to Bo-Katan who finally gets to rule Mandalore and it's not in anyone else's control and they unite all the clans. So civil war over, good times, and Sabine pops off to help the rebellion in their activities. So two things more happen that are relevant to this. One, she helps the ghost crew free the planet they started on Lothal from Imperial uh, Imperial rule. Um, But in the course of that, to save them, one of the members of that crew, a guy called Ezra Bridger, gets um, basically lost in hyperspace. And that's how he actually saves them. The thing he does to save them from the Empire gets himself lost in hyperspace. So he's just somewhere in space and no one knows where. So that's when Ahsoka and Sabine decide to go off on their quest to try and retrieve him and find him. Because he gave up his life to try and save Lothal from the Empire. Yeah. So they're going to go find him. The remaining ghost crew end up sticking with the Rebellion, and end up fighting on the Battle of Endor, including Captain Rex, who is still knocking about, old man as he is now, um, and they actually free the you know the galaxy from the Empire. Um, so that's where we're left off with. We're essentially coming into the Mandalorian now, because the Empire falls. Wasn't, wasn't the ghost ship also in the end of Rise of Skywalker? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that, if that was still the same crew. Bit of a question mark on that. We don't know. So, yeah, it's quite a while later, isn't it? So yeah, it's a long time later. Not, so uh, yeah. it could be. It could be. So the, the 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 pilot of that ship has a son by the end of the series, Jason Sandula. So I w- some people have speculated Jason Sandula takes the ship over when his mother passes, and uh, is now flying it. So that could be what's happening. Right, okay. There. But the state of the of, of of affairs is we do not know how the dark saber fell into Moff Gideon's hands. But we do know that at some point prior to the Empire being destroyed, and I didn't include it in my timeline because we don't know where this happened, they did something called the Great Purge, where they took all the Beskar and scattered all the Mandalorian clans and just laid waste to Mandalore as a planet. Which is where we're at now, with Moff Gideon having the Darksaber, Bo-Katan and a few random straggly Mandalorians are just all over the place, and Ahsoka is on this particular planet that I think they've sent, sent him to. Maybe maybe it was Con- what did they say Concordia, something like that, where they're sending our Mandalorian off to. 
to find her because she's, you know, connected to the Jedi Order. But what's clever about what they did with Ahsoka is by taking her out of the Jedi Order, when, when you know, Yoda and Obi-Wan are like, there's only one Jedi left, you know, it's Luke. The, the fact that Ahsoka's still alive doesn't matter. She doesn't count. She's not a Jedi. So they're not right, lying. Okay. So, they're, so they're not lying. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're at. Like the, um, so, so yeah, Bo-Katan is just, that's who we so met in the last a, episode. Go on, sir. And none of those characters then dealt with in Resistance, which is set in between original and sequel isn't it so resistance is set after the mandalorian um and none of those yeah but none of those characters are uh, are dealt with in that i don't believe so no i i didn't see resistant all of resistance so i don't 100 percent know but i don't believe so no Um, i was just curious which means that which could mean a few things but it also a lot of time will have passed by resistance so you could argue quite a lot of them could be dead right yeah um so uh, yeah is that was that helpful i know i just talked for like an hour and like yeah no yeah, no 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 that makes um that makes f- uh, like uh, i wouldn't be able to repeat it back to you but the broad strokes that that clarifies yeah so how are you feeling about meeting potentially so do you understand the sort of excitement about meeting someone like ahsoka in the show yeah definitely yeah i i think the show is going to do a re- have to do a really interesting balance act already like this as a as someone who's not watched them already this series has been a little harder to follow not impossible to follow but harder to follow well that was um, my question because you just you just watched I, the episode there's only one episode that I'm aware of that really connects to any of this stuff so far and it's the it's the episode with Bo-Katan did you did you feel that you were missing information when you watched that then certainly felt like the audience some of the audience would know her no you got the broad strokes of different set of Jedi a different set of Mandalorians mm-hmm. um I think the show in general is at a really interesting place because it, it kind of, it's, I think it's really, and maybe it's just me conflicted, but it's kind of like, there, it, it, it's really weird because it's almost reached a point and we've only had four episodes where I'm, I'm conflicted because part of me is like, okay, another episode of him trying to do one thing, but he gets mixed up in some crazy scrapes somewhere else. But equally, the reason I'm conflicted is because as much as I feel that's um, been done quite a lot now, that is fundamentally the show. That's always been the show. That is the premise of the show. So it feels a little unfair for that part of me going, we've seen this, even because we haven't seen it. All the side adventures are still really unique. I mean, the thing with the spiders was just some of the best visuals i've seen in star wars um mm. so yeah, I, also, I mean I baby the, Yoda so, eating the eggs was my was my highlight from that episode <laughs> it was so monstrous yeah yeah so so it's going to be really interesting to see whether how far down the law rabbit hole we go now we're bringing in ahsoka yeah it's going to be interesting because i because i mean she left last we saw ahsoka she left with sabine to go find ezra so there's a chance mm. that sabine will be with her we don't know that, obviously, right. but they left together to go find the the, 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 the the member of the ghost crew that had went missing in that battle to free the Thor. So it's like, will Sabine be with her? And if she is, do they explain that? And if she isn't, do they explain that? <laughs> because yeah, fans would be expecting those two to be together um, because the they left together in the show. It was very much they got on a ship and flew off to go find him. Like it was that's the last time we saw Ahsoka. Um you you kind of have to address that at least a little, right? But if you do, then who are you addressing that for? How can you do that in a yeah, way... exactly, yeah. Uh, how can you do that in a way that doesn't make people who don't know feel confused? <laughs> um, yeah. Or how do you... And if you don't do it, are you sh- shitting on the fans who invested in Clone Wars and invested in Rebels? You know, it's I, that's a really tough balancing act and I'm going to be fascinated to see how they do it. Um, I mean... Presumably, the mo- the main use Ahsoka is going to have in this series is going to be help, hopefully, pointing because she 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 knew Yoda, she trained with Yoda, she'll be able to say, "Oh, that's a Yoda," <laughs> you know, or she won't say it like that. She'll say, "I've worked, uh, you know, I've met one of these species before," um, but that's way more information than Mandalorian is, you know, our Mandalorian Din Djarin has had. You know, he he has literally no information about what this being is. You know, so it's such a it's such a tightrope because the and obviously I hope this doesn't sound dismissive of people that did watch Clone Wars and Rebels, but mm-hmm. given the hype and given 
the perceived viewing figures that Mandalorians got and the way it's kind of talked about by Disney. It's not just being watched by people that watched Clone Wars and no. Rebels. Like it's it's gone beyond that. So that tightrope of making it accessible for those people, but also rewarding the you know the long timers is uh, is a really interesting one to balance. Yeah, and I, and I'm worried. I'm worried because even you, you see you've you've you said it just then. Like you you even you felt a little out of the loop with Bo Katan, and I'm like that's crazy because when I watched that episode. Oh, don't get me wrong. I was like hyped that Bo Katan was on screen in live action. By the way, um, Katie Sackhoff, who plays her in the show, voiced her in the animated stuff. So that's that's very cool. It's nice that they got the. Sadly, that won't be the case for Ahsoka. Um, they've they've cast Rosario Dawson, which is dream fan casting. But when they manage to get the voice actress for Bo Katan to play Bo Katan, it seems a shame the voice actress for Ahsoka can't play Ahsoka. Um, mm, definitely, especially since the character is going to be in reasonably heavy makeup. So I feel like maybe they could have got away with that. I don't actually know what the voice actress for Ahsoka looks like, so maybe that's bullshit. Who knows? Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, and this will be a much older Ahsoka as well. And I think the reason a lot of fans are excited for her, particularly, is you know we've basically seen her from being a bratty teen learning how to be a Jedi, being exiled from the... or becoming a nomad from the Jedi, finding herself fighting for, you know, Mandalore, helping the Rebellion, like a huge part of bringing the Rebellion together. She's a huge part of how the, the Rebellion came together to defeat the Empire in the first place. Even though she's not in any of the original trilogy movies, her hand is in that now. You know, so she is such an important part of the Star Wars canon. How do you introduce her without? without reverence because you, the only way to make fans not feel like they're missing something is to introduce her without reverence <laughs> but fans yeah. of those things want that reverence you know what i mean yeah but bo, bo katan wasn't introduced with a lot of reverence i don't think like i say the no. broad stroke of different set of mandalorians came but was clear mm. um and i don't you'll have to tell me but i don't feel like i've not seen any headlines that would suggest that disappointed people no, I, I, I'm, Nadia will tell you. I was like, I was like, it's Bo-Katan. I think it's Bo-Katan. I, I recognize the voice. I think it's Bo-Katan. And then it was Bo-Katan. I was like, yes. <laughs> like I was like, I was excited. I was literally. Mm. And by the way, it's worth noting for anyone thinking, Dan, you sound really annoying to watch the Mandalorian with. Um, I will tell you right now that Nadia's favorite thing about the Mandalorian is because it's often quite silent because he's just him with his helmet and Baby Yoda. That gives her lots of time to. And I'm going to quote directly here: make comments. So. That was my one moment of making comments during The Mandalorian. The rest of it is quiet time for me. <laughs> Noti- okay. Notice the addition of for me. <laughs> the amount of times yeah, I heard her I... say this week that, uh, that she wanted Baby Yoda to get his damn macarons. <laughs> yeah, in my experience, like Dan and Nadia watch TV a very similar way, which is if they're not making comments about the thing themselves, they're looking at you to see if you're about to make a comment about the thing. <laughs> it's, <laughs> very... it's very endearing it's not a criticism at all <laughs> but dan's the kind of dan's like dan's like the repeat the joke kind of telly watcher like the joke will be like big banana and you just hear dan going <laughs> big bananas <laughs> <laughs> so yeah god i hope that's not true um, <laughs> that sounds awful i sound I sound like a you're monster. worse you're worse you're you're most like that when watching if you're introducing something if you're introducing someone to something then don't think Dan's watching the thing. He's watching you. Like, he's looking for expressions of joy and appreciation <laughs> and like laughter. Uh, yeah, so laugh loud or I'm going to come for you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need uh, to pause it every 10 minutes. Tell him you're enjoying it. <laughs> Again, I mean, it's an endearing quality. I don't mean this uh, offensively. Um, so was that, did I just baffle you with too many names, too much science, too much history? Or was that... No, no, no. I got the, I, I got the broad strokes. Yeah, good. Because that was the whole point of me doing this was like, oh, I, I can, we can do it differently. But it ended up just being me giving a lecture. Thank you for coming to my TED talk, by the way. Um, yeah, so I found I, so, suddenly like ten minutes in, I was like, oh shit, Dan wanted this to be conversational, but I don't know any of this stuff, so I can't. Other than the occasional yeah, question, there's not I, much I can add here. <laughs> like, yeah, that's. I started to realize I was going that we that, that this was badly conceived from the start because yeah, if you don't know, because <laughs> if, if you don't know this stuff, then what questions do you have to ask? Yeah. Like yeah, well, well, yeah. I had the same realization about five ten minutes in. I was like, ah, shit, we just have to run with it now. <laughs> Worth doing though. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, hopefully anybody who listened to this who doesn't know that stuff got something out of it. Um, I think I got a bit looser as we got towards the Rebel stuff because I was like conscious of time and I hope that that was... Yeah. Um, but, you know, basically lots of civil wars. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the history of Mandalore. Um, and I guess we've got... A bit, the other thing as well with the show, by the way, is they've got a... With Mandalorian, before we, before we get to very quickly... They've got to explain. There's a gap right now. We we don't understand. Last we saw, Bo-Katan was on Mandalore ruling it with the Darksaber. We've heard of a thing called the Great Purge that then happened. We don't know the details of that. We don't know how she lost the Darksaber. We don't know why exactly the Mandalorian clans got scattered the way they did. And we don't know how Moff Gideon got given the, the, the Darksaber. So there's still there's, there's, there's a big blank patch now between the end of sort of the stuff we know about from, like, Rebels to post the original trilogy, you know, Mandalorian, Mm. where we're just like, something went on in the middle there. That it's it's it's, So I'm wondering, will the show fill in those gaps, or are they just going to sort of leave that intentionally vague? I'd like to think, I would like to know what happened that led to Bo-Katan losing the Darksaber. Um, But yeah, we don't know. And it's worth worth knowing. For that to happen, you kind of have to have Bo Katan face off with Moff Gideon, then, don't you? Yes, that's that's what I was saying to Nadia. Like the real payoff would be for Bo Katan to fight Moff Gideon. But Ahsoka's got badass white lightsabers, and Moff Gideon's got the dark saber. That's a cool visual, but it's not as thematically satisfying to me. But not as thematically satisfying uh, to me, who's watched those shows. Yeah, exactly. The, that's the tightrope because the most satisfying for someone that's not seen any of that shit is the Mandalorian fighting Morph Gideon. <laughs> Correct. Ex- this is the problem. The, this is the problem the show is now going to face because to me, what I want to see as a person who's watched those shows because the thematic thing to do is the person who's the rightful ruler of Mandalore, Bo-Katan, take on the guy that's wielding the Darksaber, reunite the clans for the ninth time and take her place at the top of the throne. But we ain't going to get that, are we? Uh, but I, I, you know, the only thing I can think that might happen is maybe Mando ends up being the one to take out Moff Gideon and she does the same thing she did with Sabine when Sabine came back to Mandalore with the dark saber and is like, look, I've had my chance. She could now say I've had my chance twice <laughs> and blown it. I ain't doing it a third. I don't think Mando wants that though, does he? No, no, he might not, but 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 maybe maybe he'll find his calling in that. Maybe he'll, you know, he's he, he is a bit lost, isn't he? I mean, the baby Yoda's given him a goal, but once that once that child finds its home, what does he do with his life? Like, is he just going to go back to being a bounty? Well, exactly. Again, that's the difficulty. We know there's a third series. Are we are we dicking about trying to get baby Yoda somewhere? Series three again. That's um. Mm. You know, even if you've not watched the others, I think the it's that's what I mean. It's a fascinating time for the show. Yeah, I'm kind of excited. Maybe, maybe what we'll do when the series is ended is we'll do another one of these, just like one-offs or something, where we just sort of t- chat through some of what we thought about what they did with this in mind, this conversation in mind. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm 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 really excited. I'm really enjoying it. Um, hopefully, that was interesting for people um, who didn't know that stuff or it was a good refresher yeah, I think for pe- so. a good refresher for people who did especially with ahsoka coming this week we didn't say this up top but we're recording this prior to the in quote marks ahsoka episode we think it's going to be episode five because it's the one day filoni himself directed uh, we're recording on the 24th of november which is like three days out from that so yeah we shall see Friday is coming. You shall see. Oh, thick and fast. But thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, and thanks to Chris, who is an absolute hero for agreeing to do, one, an extra podcast, uh, two, listen to me rant for 35 to 40 minutes um, about Star Wars patiently. And <laughs> I'm just sorry I couldn't be more pedantic. I feel like I let people down in that respect. <laughs> you, were, you were reasonably pedantic right up top. <laughs> so I think we yeah, got it. I think you... Yeah. <laughs> What's a Mandalore? <laughs> <laughs> but my hope my hope was to like really do that throughout but of course that would mean we you know would still be on Duff Mole if I did that so yeah that yeah I started yeah yeah we there was just too much stuff um hopefully I didn't get anything wrong but I'm sure people correct us in the comments but yeah we're um we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully have some Ahsoka this week and we'll be able to come back at some point to have a chat about this but yeah thank you because again he not only has he done this as an extra podcast on an already busy work week but he's also not feeling very well today <laughs> and he's still like he woke up with a horse uh, horse with uh, like a horse throat 
What's voice? Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not too bad now, but um, throughout the day it keeps coming and going. So yeah, yeah. So like for battling through illness to do an extra podcast because I'm like maybe we should talk about the Mandalorian. I appreciate I appreciate that very much. Yeah, because Dan's like Dan's like ten people that already know this stuff are going to listen to this, Chris. We need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go thanks very much for listening everyone i'm gonna leave that at that i have nothing to add to i could i could tag that joke all day long about how no one listens but you know people know they see the figures uh <laughs> no, 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 no i think i think i think people listen i'm just fairly confident the only people who listen will be people that already know yeah <laughs> to be fair fine. though i mean I, as this series was going if i hadn't watched rebels and Clone yeah, wars I recently a good idea. You'd i'd be, have definitely stuck out something yeah. like this yeah, no, this was a this was a good idea, mate. I watched a recap of Star Trek Dis- Star Trek Discovery series one and two, despite having no intention to watch series three. Amazing, series three's been great. Series three of Star Trek Discovery has been a bit of Star Trek Discovery has been a bit of a reset as well. So you don't really even need to watch right. the previous seasons. I watched a recap the other day of the 100, just because I was I was like, what was going on in the 100? It's pretty <laughs> confusing as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's it was going that way, wasn't it? Uh, were yeah. any more or less confusing than what I took you through today? Uh, no more, I would say, because that was like fifteen minutes, so that you took more time with it. So yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so yeah, comments below. Obviously, excited for Ahsoka. Um, do you care about any of this stuff? Um, is is the history of Mandalore as confusing to the rest of you as it is to, to even people who've seen Rebels and Clone Wars go wait who was in charge at what point because it's so filled with like back and forth um, yeah um, oh worth noting as well didn't mention this Darth Maul died in, in the end he, uh, old Darth oh, Maul in Rebels went off to find Obi-Wan for his final revenge Obi-Wan just samurai him just one swoop with his lightsaber and Maul just collapsed dead it's awesome oh, shit nice there you go. <laughs> Shit. Well, the, to be fair, he's still pretty pissed probably about him chopping up his girlfriend. So Yeah. Makes sense. I think so. Reasonable, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you again for maybe something similar to this. <laughs> Otherwise, obviously stick on the channel for Analyzing Avatar every Tuesday. Um, but yeah, and the Patreon and all that stuff. Thanks very much for listening. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.